In 1998, Good Will Hunting won a Golden Globe and an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. It's an outstanding example of character development, brilliantly orchestrated conflict, and using exposition as ammunition. Here are eight screenwriting secrets in Good Will Hunting. If you want to show the audience what the main character is like before they undergo the transformation of the story, it's important to establish their ordinary world. At the end of Goodwill Hunting, the main character has exorcised his demons, gotten a high paying job at a prestigious firm, and goes cross country to be with the woman he loves. So let's see how different this is from his ordinary world in the beginning of the story. We see that Will and his friends spend a lot of time in bars. Hi Will. Christian, how you doing? Hi. Baseball is also very important in their lives. Stop rushing me back. Stop crowding the plate. Which one will it be? Hey, boy, take two back. Take two. Hey, Come on, give me one little peek. No. We'll go to the cage. Come on, not in my glove. <laughs> I didn't use the glove. <laughs> That's my little league glove. You know, be neighbors, you know, we'll have little kids, fucking take them a little league together up fully failed. We also see that Will and his friends enjoy fighting. Oh, what's up? You still tough? Come on! Come on, that's a jackpot. Come here. Come here. That's a But I mean, if you have a problem like that, I mean, we could just step outside, we could figure it out. Oh man, there's no problem. Come on, it's me, it's me, Will. Remember, we went to kindergarten together. Yeah. We do. Oh, 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 All right, who's first? Come on, motherfucker! All right, who's first? Oh, Come on, who's Danny first? Boy. And yet, there's a major difference between Will's ordinary world and that of his friends. He's a voracious reader. Remember, the audience enters the story through your protagonist. It's important to show us their ordinary world so that we understand where they're coming from. When it comes to the characters in Goodwill Hunting, certain questions are easy to answer about them. For example, what's their greatest skill? She had all sorts of wonderful little idiosyncrasies. <laughs> you know, she used to fart in her sleep. <laughs> I'm sorry I shared that with you. Well, you look lovely in those glasses. Thank you very much. They're just beautiful. Yes, I always wanted that blue eyeshadow. Here's an important one. What's their biggest fear? For Will, it's obvious. Trusting someone that will end up abandoning him. Don't put your shit on me when you're the one that's afraid. I'm afraid. What, what, what am I afraid of? What the fuck am I afraid of? You're afraid of? of me. You're afraid that I won't love you back. Lambo is afraid of not being the smartest person in the room. Most days I wish I never met you. It was then I could sleep at night. I didn't, I didn't have to walk around with the knowledge that there was someone like you out there. Sean is afraid of getting back out in the world. He's holed up in the basement level of the aptly named Bunker Hill Community College. You ever think about getting remarried? My wife's dead. Hence the word remarried. She's dead. Well, I think that's a super philosophy, Sean. I mean, that way you could actually go through the rest of your life without ever really knowing anybody. Another good question to know about your characters. What's their biggest source of pain? Have you had any uh, experience with that? 20 years of counseling. Yeah, I've seen some pretty awful shit. Maybe you married the wrong woman. Maybe you should watch your mouth. Watch it right there, Chief, all right? My father died when I was 13 and I inherited this money. The only thing every day I wake up, and I wish that I could give it back, that I would give it back in a second, if it meant I could have one more day with him. Consequently, what's the emotional shield they use because of the pain? Just want to be with don't you because bullshit. I love you! Don't bullshit me! Don't you love fucking you. bullshit me! It's not your fault. Don't fuck with me. It's not your fault. Don't fuck with me, all right? Don't fuck with me, Sean, not you. It's not your fault. You ever think about getting remarried? My wife's dead. Hence the word remarried. She's dead. Come here. 
It's Saturday. <laughs> Unless you want to have a drink with me tonight. A difficult theorem can be like a symphony. It's very erotic. It's no surprise that the characters in Goodwill Hunting feel like real, living people. Answer these questions about your own characters and watch them come to life. The main character of Good Will Hunting is obviously Will Hunting. He is the one that undergoes the biggest journey of change throughout the story. Notice how various characters give Will a call to action in their separate storylines and how they help Will realize his transformation. First, we have Professor Lambeau, who provides the call of action for the A story. I've spoken to the judge, and he's agreed to release you. First condition is that you meet with me every week. Finite math. Sounds like a real hoot. For the romantic subplot, here's the call to action from Skylar. You're an idiot. I've been sitting over there for 45 minutes waiting for you to come and talk to me. But I'm tired now and I have to go home. There's my number. So maybe we can go out for coffee sometime. When it comes to the internal subplot, the one that will help Will carry out his emotional catharsis, we get the call to action from Sean. Unless you want to talk about you, who you are, then I'm fascinated. Your move, Chief. And finally, notice how the final call to action comes late in the story, from the one person that Will trusts more than anybody else in the world. In 20 years, if you're still living here, coming over my house to watch the Patriots game, you're still working construction, I'll fucking kill you. Because tomorrow I'm gonna wake up and I'll be 50. And I'll still be doing this shit. I mean, you're sitting on a winning lottery ticket. You're too much of a pussy to cash it in. That's bullshit. Thinking of the secondary characters' roles and pushing the protagonist along on their journey helps us to make sure that they serve the story in a powerful way. Here's the secret to exposition. If the characters have an action that underlies the exposition, the audience will notice it less. In other words, if characters use it as ammunition to achieve their desires, the exposition becomes invisible. If the only subtext of a piece of exposition is simply to explain something to the audience, that's when it becomes painfully obvious. Let's take a look at the brilliant use of exposition as ammunition in Goodwill Hunting. We have exposition used to thwart another character. Ibid, Your Honor. Son, my turn. I've been sitting here for 10 minutes now looking over this rap sheet of yours. September 93, assault. Grand theft auto, February 94. I'm also aware that you've been through several foster homes. You know, another judge might care, but you hit a cop, you're going in. In 1905, there were hundreds of professors renowned for their study of the universe, but it was a 26-year-old Swiss patent clerk doing physics in his spare time who changed the world. Pretty dramatic, Jerry. No, it isn't, Sean. This boy has that gift. Hey, Jerry. In the 1960s, there was a young man graduated from University of Michigan, did some brilliant work in mathematics. Then he moved to Montana and he blew the competition away. Hey, Timmy! Yo! Who's Ted Kaczynski? Unibob! He pushes people away before they have a chance to leave him. It's a defense mechanism, all right? And if you push him right now, it's gonna be the same thing all over again, and I'm not gonna let that happen to him. There's exposition used to attack others. It's really out of the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's real Just because you don't have to sleep in your one-room palace right. tonight. Don't start right. thinking you're bad. I was honoring, you know, taking that 40-minute train ride so those college kids can come in in the morning and their floors are clean and their wastebaskets are empty. That's real work. That's right. I just have a little question here. You could be a janitor anywhere. Why did you work at the most prestigious technical college in the whole fucking world? Because I don't give a shit about your medal, because I knew you before you were a mathematical god. When you were pimple-faced and homesick and didn't know what side of the bed to piss on. And finally, we have exposition used by characters to defend themselves. So how long has it been since we've seen each other? Before Nancy died. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was in Paris. It was that damn conference. What do you want to know? What? That I don't have 12 brothers? Yeah. That I'm a fucking orphan? Yeah, you don't I want to hear that it. I got fucking cigarettes put out of me when I was a little kid. I didn't know that this that. isn't fucking surgery, that the motherfucker stabbed me. When characters use exposition in this way, the audience becomes more concerned with the outcome of the conflict, rendering the exposition completely invisible.
Locations are important in bringing a story to life and can even give us further insight into characters. For example, notice where Will and his friends spend all their time. Bars. Batting cages. Little league games. Another location gives us insight into their emotional immaturity. Conversely, Will's apartment is mainly furnished with stacks of books that he reads voraciously. Notice how Sean's apartment gives us an insight into his personal life and emotional state. When it comes to first date scenes, Goodwill Hunting does an excellent job with subverting the usual dinner scene in a nice restaurant. Will and Skylar meet in a gift shop and get to know each other as they play with kitschy items. Then they have dinner in a burger stand and have their first kiss with their mouths full of food. On their second date, they again go somewhere off the beaten path, a Greyhound racetrack. So the lesson here, keep your locations fresh and make them serve the story. In storytelling, there's a natural balance that happens when things occur in threes. Showing something once isn't enough to show us any change. Twice starts to build tension, but isn't quite enough. As they say, the third time's a charm. Let's look at how the rule of three occurs in Goodwill Hunting. We see Chucky going to Will's house to pick him up three times in the movie. The first time establishes an event in Will's ordinary world, before the story has even started. The second time occurs right after Sean has challenged Will in the park. Unless you want to talk about you, who you are. But you don't want to do that, do you, sport? So when Will comes out the door, we know that he's not quite the same as the first time. And finally, we see the biggest change in the story when Chucky comes the third and final time. Will has left to find Skyler in California. Another example, we see Will riding the train three times. The first time occurs after he sees the first math problem on the chalkboard. Interestingly, this is the key incident that starts the story world. Without the math problem, everybody continues living life in their normal way. The second time we see Will riding the train, he has just been caught by Professor Lambeau solving the second math problem. It's no mistake that this is the inciting incident that kickstarts the story into motion. It's the event that disrupts the normal balance of the characters' lives. In the third and final time that we see Will on the train, he has just gone through his emotional catharsis with Sean. The rule of three can also pertain to the number of characters interacting in a given scene. While having two characters is enough to create conflict, adding a third character creates a nice triangle that takes the interactions to a higher level. There's a great example of this in the pub scene. Notice how both Lambo and Sean use a third character to help make their arguments. Tim, can you help us? We're trying to settle a bet. You ever heard of Jonas Saw? Sure, cured polio. How about Gerald Lambeau? No. Huh. So who won the bet? I did. Yeah, so who was he? Ted Kaczynski. I haven't heard him. Hey, Timmy! Yo! Who's Ted Kaczynski? Unibob! Think of the rule of three in terms of story and how there are three parts, beginning, middle, and end. We all know how important it is to have conflict in your screenplay. It's the engine that drives the story from point A to point Z. And the word conflict doesn't have to mean actual fighting or yelling. Other good terms might be opposition or tension. In Goodwill Hunting, there's conflict in almost every character interaction, even among friends and loved ones. For example, Skylar is Will's love interest in the story, and yet there's plenty of conflict in their interactions. We can have playful, sexually charged conflict. You're an idiot. What? You're an idiot. I've been sitting over there for 45 minutes waiting for you to come and talk to me. All right, yeah. I mean, maybe we could just get together and eat a bunch of caramels. What do you mean? When well, you think about it, it's as arbitrary as drinking coffee. Hello? Uh, Skylar. Yep. Hey, uh, it's Will. You know, the really funny, good-looking guy you met at the bar the other night? I don't recall meeting anyone who matches that description. I think I'd remember. I know you've been thinking about it. <laughs> oh, no, I haven't. Yes, you have. You happen to get a good night kiss? No, you know, I tell you, I was hoping to get a good night late. <laughs> we also have conflict that comes from the rising stakes after our first date. Where have you been? I'm sorry, I've been, like, I've been really busy. And I'm sorry, you know, I blew, I blew it. No. I was wondering if, uh, if, you know, you'd give me another crack at it, you know, let me take you out again. Oh, I can't. All right. Come on, <laughs> let's go have some fun. No, I, I've got to learn this. 
Well, you're not going to his surgery tomorrow, are you? No. What if I said I would not sleep with you again until you let me meet your friends? I'd say it's like 4.30 in the morning, they're probably up. Men are shameless. If you're not thinking with your wiener, then you're acting directly on its behalf. Next, we have Will's friends. Notice how their interactions are constantly laced with conflict. Had a double burger. Did you shut the fuck up? I know what you ordered, I was there. So give me that fucking sandwich. You mean your sandwich, I bought it. I mean, how hot is it to push a motherfucking broom around the room? You got room. fired from pushing the fucking broom. No, and I forgot the number. Fucking retarded, you went all the way out there in the rain, you didn't bring that number? No, it was your mother's 900 number, I just ran out of cards. <laughs> Are you said we're gonna see your place. No, not tonight. Oh no, not tonight. Not any other night, honey. He knows once you see that little shit hole, he's getting dropped like a bad habit. And don't forget conflict that occurs when characters want something. Almost every desire should be met with opposition. Is this is the buildings and grounds office. Yeah, what can I do for you? I just need the name of the student who works here. Well, if anything was stolen, I should know. No, no, no. It's nothing like that. I just need his name. I can't give you his name unless you have a complaint. 1887 said it, and I quote, this is excuse me, century, excuse gonna me. It's going to make a mockery of the court. I am afforded the right to speak in my own defense, sir. Why don't we give him time to figure out what he wants? That's a wonderful theory, Sean. It worked wonders for you, didn't it? Yeah, it did, you arrogant fucking prick. Oh, I won't see you make him feel like a failure, too. He won't be a failure, but, Sean. But if you push him, Jerry, if you Sean. ride him. Without good conflict, a story can falter and become lifeless. Take a lesson from Goodwill Hunting and have conflict in almost every single interaction. There's a tremendous buildup of tension between the characters in Goodwill Hunting. As a result, there are some powerful moments of emotional catharsis that make the story engaging for the audience. First and foremost, we have Will and Sean. <laughs> yeah, you know, I figured I'm just gonna put my money back on the table and see what kind of cards I get. Good luck, son. Then we have the conflict resolution between Sean and Lambo. Sean, I, um... Me too, Jerry. Yeah, good. I was being ironical. How about it rink right now? Yeah, it's a good idea. We also have the resolution of Will leaving the ordinary world he had with his friends. We knew you had to get back and forth to Cambridge for your new job, and I knew I wasn't gonna fucking drive you every day, so. Happy 21, Will. Happy 21, bro. Oh! And of course, we have the major unresolved catharsis when Will goes to California to find Skyler. Sean, if the professor calls about that job, just tell him, sorry. I had to go see about a girl. Son of a bitch. He stole my life. So don't forget, we all want to see a movie because we want to feel something. Think of the emotional catharsis as a release valve for the pressure cooker of tension building up in your screenplay. So what other films would you like to see me cover for screenwriting? Let me know in the comments below. A sincere thank you to my wonderful patrons for supporting me on Patreon. Also, be sure to subscribe and tap the bell to be notified of upcoming videos. More great content is on the way. Thank you so much for watching.